pipe. To say, I worked for companies in uh, 91. I sold my company and retired. I was 49 at the time. Oh, okay. And then uh, kind of went back to my first love, which was physics, and then started teaching as an adjunct instructor for a local community college. Oh, okay. for years. Uh, in 2003, I guess it is, I published my first paper in uh, New Astronomy. Oh, okay. And then I published on Archive until 2010. And people don't accept my papers anymore. I'm uh, fairly uh, unorthodox in my thinking, as the video will show you. Cool. Okay. Okay, so let's begin your video then. Because I think that's the cue to watch your video. The scalar theory of everything is a paradigm shift and a causal model of the universe. This is the paper. This video starts with the foundation, forms a universal equation, applies the equation to the current observational problems. These are, I calculate a theoretical universe temperature, which no one else does. The galaxy rotation curves are still a problem because the dark matter has not been found. Asymmetric RCs are a problem because nobody knows why. Galaxy redshift because the correlation coefficients are very poor. Periodic redshift, again, no model. The pioneer anomaly has 10 characteristics of which only one has been explained. Planet nine, they're still looking for it. Coherent light for particles, which has not been done before. And a model of a photon, which gives us diffraction, the transparent max experiment, which rejects wave models of light. And gravity is the asymmetry of the magnetic field and some others. I start with Newton. Newton established a major physics advance that was confirmed by predicting the late return of Halley's Comet. Newton identified three characteristics of bodies that have identified three characteristics of mass. After Newton, then I examined experiments and observations without intervening models. For example, I don't concern myself with Doppler shift for the galaxy, it's a galaxy redshift, not a Doppler shift, if you see the difference. I form a model to explain all the universe. Postulates that the stuff of the universe is continually being emitted through sources at the center of spiral galaxies and ejected through sinks at the center of elliptical galaxies. The stuff of the universe are HODs, which are discrete magnets that cause a depression in the plenum. They are two dimensional. Plenum, which is like an ether, continuous, that supports wave action and the interaction of the HODs and plenum. Matter bodies are emergent assemblies of HODs and plenum. The huge issue facing physics today is that the foundations of the big, the classical, and the small size scales are inconsistent with each other. The stow is justified because it corresponds to all scales, it, the model, many of the problem, and has made predictions which were later observed. The three characteristics of mass or bodies, weight, the plenum force acts on the surface of the hods. The inertial mass is the property of the plenum required to support waves and gravitational mass is the effect of hods on the plenum. A body has hods held in place by the plenum. Newton's model works by defining forces that are exerted on bodies by an ether, then adding forces vectors to arrive at a single force that predicts the body's measurable motion. Note, forces, not energy. Newton suggested a reductionist step in theory by positing an ether whose divergence exerted a force 
that caused gravity and that caused the fraction. And by positing corpuscles as light as components of matter, that is, support for the ether and corpuscles was because the model could explain several diverse observations, then known but mysterious, rather than by direct observation. Uh, today, this might be known as a theory of everything. I started the stall by returning to Newton's path and then jumping forward to the quasi-steady state cosmology of Hoyle. This is the reference. The QSFC suggested a source of the stuff of our universe at the center of galaxies. It solved the rotation curves of spiral galaxies and other current problems. This is the cluster structure according to the stone. We have source galaxies, elliptical galaxies, sources and sinks. Sources emit plenum and hods, which then form hydrogen, which then flows outward from the spiral galaxy. Some of it forms suns and flows back inward to nova. The iron core of the nova then forms black holes. The black holes fall into the center of the spiral galaxies. Now the plenum density is very high and this crushes the black holes. And this is seen by X-ray bursts, which are unaccompanied by other radiation. These have been noted they have been connected to black holes, but people do not still understand what these X-ray bursts are all about. Another output of the NOVA is heavy elements, rocks, some of which go back in as, as solar systems. Others flow outward to the inner galactic space and then flow back into the sinks, where some of them come in hot, they flow out, they cool down, and they flow back in. This is the observed cooling flow. This is the cluster structure. We have spiral galaxies around the outside and elliptical galaxies in the middle that are sinking all the matter that these spiral galaxies are emitting. Benny and Merrifield for a description of galactic astronomy. Universal equations formed. This is the plenum density at some point. You'll notice it consists of components from the source, the sink, and matter. The numerator here is the strength of the source or sink and the gravitational force of the matter of the hods. You'll note they are all inversely proportional to the radius. That is, it's three-dimensional space, not four. Three dimensions and only three dimensions. The row, the vertices of the row, top product with the normal of the hod surface, hod surface, forms a force on the hod. The force on the hod divided by the inertial mass of the hod then gives you the acceleration. You'll note all the universe causes the force or directs the path of a dropped object. This is a Machian theory. It is a causative theory. OK, so is that about? Is that good or will it? Should I continue? Oh, John? You can't hear. You oh. can't hear, John. Okay. Are you able to hear us, John? Something is happening. Let's see. Yeah, I hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, I had my I had my mic turned off. Oh, okay, okay. So is that is that good? I think we did about seven minutes and forty. Um, I was going to look. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. The rest of sorry. The rest of it is uh, those various experiments and problem observations. You know, doing the calculations. I'll definitely check it out. Experiments. What I can do is I can share some of your papers on screen as well, if if it would help you. Uh, yeah. You know, because we did that before, it seems to work well. But um. 
I'm sure there's lots of questions as well. So, yeah. Um, well, at the beginning of the video, there was a link to a paper, and that paper is a summary, which then links to all the other papers. Aha. So, I've got a scalar theory of everything unites the big, small, and the four forces by extending. Oh, hang on, I think you've dropped something into the chat. Let's check it out. Oh, no, so. I just see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, so I, I could share that paper or um, hang on, I'll just go back to YouTube and I'll check that link for probably the best thing to do. Scalar theory of everything. So why is it called a, uh, why is it scalar? Um, what's it's scalar? scalar it's scalar because that rho is actually a scalar quantity. We ended up calculating that row, which is the plenum, what I call a plenum density. And I call it a plenum instead of an ether because an ether has some other connotations, which I do not include. And what are they? So it's, well, a lot of people have ether theories and they consider it some kind of fluid or some kind of mass. Uh, therefore, in experiments, in the Michelson Morley experiment, they expected to find a luminiferous ether uh, and therefore show a velocity. But Michelson Morley failed, you see. So it can't have any kind of mass characteristic or fluid characteristic. Uh huh, yeah. It's more along the lines of, of Descartes' plenum. That's where the word comes from, is from Descartes. Uh, so, so why? What is? Um, I mean, if if it doesn't have mass, is it a substance? Like, I mean, photons. I guess they don't have mass. Either. Well, it's it's a component of the universe, but it's not a mass. It's a component, but it's not so a bit like what it, would you equate it to a photon then? Because that is a similar characteristic, right? Well. Um, it's the inertia. It's it's the inertia. So a body, such as the photon or other matter particles, are essentially hods combined with uh, uh, the inertia, which is the plenum. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's interesting. So it, it's it that's what that's what gives you the equivalence principle. The gravitational mass, which is what the hot is, holds plenum, which is the inertial mass. And that's the equivalence principle. Right. So you have, yeah, I get it. So what does it have any uh, relationship to the Higgs field, or does it replace it, or? Or anything? No. Okay. It doesn't talk about Higgs at all. The, right. the, uh, or if if you want to be very crude about it, you could say the hot is the Higgs particle, except that uh, the the the, uh, the hot has a very low energy. So you see what a photon is is a column of these odds. Okay. So, so hods are like more fundamental than a photon. Yes, <laughs> a photon is made up of hods. It's a column of hods. Now, one of the things, Sorry, one, of the things photons, one of the things photons must do is to have different energy levels. Well, in the photoelectric experiment, the slope of that line that you get uh, is essentially H, H bar, you know, Planck's constant. And so each of these hods has an energy level of Planck's constant. Uh -huh. You see, and, and so you get the different energies of photons because there's a column of them and they all kind of add. So the energy of a photon is the number of hods that are in it. 
And your theory is a three-dimensional theory, so this column must be stacked in three dimensions. Can't be in a fourth dimension. The the column is three dimensional, but the hot itself is two. And the reason why it kind of has to be two is because a photon travels at the fastest speed that it can through vacuum or through matter. And it can only do that if if the force that exerted on it in the direction of its movement is zero. And that's what a two-dimensional surface does. Okay. Okay, so that's sort of the reasoning behind that. There was a lot of other things. So are you saying that your theory helps uh, explain things like periodic redshift, the pioneer anomaly, and model of a photon, and a few others? Does it deal with Yes, that? and that's what the rest of that 40-minute uh, video is about. Okay, so you go into detail using mathematics to describe those right things. and each of those each of those steps involves a paper that you know i have out there okay yeah actually i can share that paper now um are you putting in the chat Christopher? um well this is the paper i can put it in the chat as well yeah absolutely so it's okay if it is there also it's okay uh yeah i mean, I mean chat maybe okay yeah well Scalar theory of everything unites the big, the small, and the four forces by extending Newton's model. So yeah, you can link, uh, put the link. In the yeah, I'll do that now. Um, oh, there you go. Thanks. Uh, oh, fantastic. I don't know if that's a link. Oh, that's sorry. That's only that's half. That's right. That's only half. It's okay. Here we go. It's um, it's on ResearchGate. Oh yeah, I think I may have seen some of it. So it's interesting, actually. It's um, a bit of a shame that Wenzong is is muted, but I noticed that there's a similarity between your research and Wenzong's because he was talking about like a, a kind of a super. It's slightly different now. Super fluid in space like a Bose-Einstein con condensate that gets sucked into stars and heated up and turned into particles that so it's like an eternal universe phenomenon where um wavelengths very large wavelengths called super photons are like recondensed into uh, faster or higher energy part or higher frequency particles that go out then and you know the universe has no ending, but I notice in your model there's also a kind of a what would you call it like where water evaporates and then rains. It's got a similar kind of flow, to, like a circular cycle to it. It starts in the galaxies, goes out into novas, then black holes, and then back into the center. Is that accurate or? Well, in spiral galaxies, and we differentiate spiral and elliptical galaxies are two different things. Okay. Yeah. In yeah, spiral galaxies. Sorry, go ahead. In spiral galaxies, the source of the stuff of the universe, plenum and hods, is ejected from the center, flows out, some of it comes back in, you know, and forms essentially the supermassive black hole and all those other black holes at the center of our galaxy. Gotcha. Now, yeah. I have to kind of go a little aside here. Yeah. A black hole is nothing more than a whole bunch of hods. You know, it's the gravitational mass, period, in a, you know, that falls into a black hole. And when a black hole gets close to the center, that is to say, within about 45 AU of Sagittarius A, the plenum density collapses the black hole into its component parts, which then are re-emitted as Hodge's X-ray radiation, which is unexplained from the center of the galaxy, Hello. in burst. And the reason for the burst is that's when a smaller black hole gets evaporated. That's the X-ray burst. Uh -huh. from the center, you see. Yes. Now, everything in the universe ends up eventually leaving spiral galaxies and falling into elliptical galaxies. 
oh. where it goes out in a sink. Now, in terms of my use of the term source and sink, think thermodynamically, source and sink. Yeah. You see. I got you. You see. Now, well, I don't know what to say. Well, this, business, I, oh yeah. this business of the black hole collapsing. One, yeah. one of the things that we have to explain uh, is the density of matter, meaning the atomic type of matter relationship, what's called uppercase Z, relation to the radius of a spiral galaxy. And that's done because the the distance between hods and a photon varies with plenum density. The greater the density, the closer the spacing. You see, and that's what collapses the black hole. Now, this is part of the Michelson Morley experiment. Okay. You see. Um, Michelson Morley experiment um, is commonly thought to have a null result. Well, this is untrue. The result was much less than they expected to find, but it was still a result. And one of the papers there uh, calculates that this result they had relative to their time they took the measurements is related to the position of the sun and moon. You see, so the gravitational force of the sun and moon, which is the plenum gradient, is caused some small value, and that small value uh, is is what is changing in the Michelson Morley experiment, which is the same thing as what's happening with black holes. Okay. Yes, but it does the Michael Moore um the Michael Morley experiment uh doesn't that like measure you know the speed of light um on the ro on the rotating earth kind of thing and it shows it that it's zero or like it's it's the same whether it's you know perpendicular to the horizon or or the equator or or, or not so how does that relate to the moon and the sun I don't follow that part sorry well, uh, the common perception of the Michelson Morley experiment is that it had a null result. But yep. if you go back to the paper, you will find they did not have a null result. It was very much smaller than what they expected. Oh. But it was still a result, meaning it was a positive number. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I have heard of that, but I haven't dug into it. So, but could that result be... Um... Like, is it negligible enough to be an error in the calculation or? Uh, it's outside their error limits, at least the error limits they say in their paper. Okay. Which means it is a positive result. Uh -huh. And if I remember right, it's something like three or four sigma kind of level. Yes. So this needs to be explained. And you feel that it can be explained through your theory as long as we include the positions of the sun and the moon. Is that correct? That's right. It's it's correlated. And let me say correlated rather than caused here. It's okay. correlated to the position of the sun and the moon. And there was a paper written on that. It's in the references there. Interesting. I'll check that out. I'm actually interested in um this might not might not be related to your work or what you're talking about here, but have you heard of um uh solar eclipses or uh, lunar eclipses? I think it's solar um affecting the way a pendulum s swings. Have you heard about that experiment? Well, I guess I'm going to say it should, because even in standard classical theory, you know, the mass of the moon moving around causes tides on Earth. And if it can cause a tide, you know, the gravitational attraction can cause tides, then yeah. certainly it's going to change the uh, uh, timing of a pendulum. <laughs> Yes, that makes sense. OK, so another issue, what you were talking about um, spirals uh, kind of being the source for elliptical galaxies, which are the sink, correct? 
Uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> but you're I mean, saying on, the, I, yeah. that the energy born in a spiral galaxy is kind of sucked in and forms the elliptical galaxy. So they're kind of like older galaxies or maybe the children of galaxies or something, if you want to look at it that way. But what yeah. I was, I'm just wondering, is that something that comes straight out of your theory or is that something that astronomers have observed through telescopes? Probably not, actually, because they've never observed well, galaxies. What they observe is uh, the structure of what you might call galaxy clusters. In general, the, the, the galaxy cluster is spiral galaxies on the outside of a cluster and elliptical galaxies in the middle. Okay. You That's see? A, I didn't know that about the structure. Yeah. Well. That's interesting. And that's a mystery as well. <laughs> well, that's one of the mysteries. <laughs> you know, is the structure of these galaxy clusters is obviously not explained. In the Big Bang model, all galaxies are supposed to be a result of the infall of matter. Well, the infall of matter explanation works for elliptical galaxies, but it doesn't work for spiral galaxies because they notice a lot of matter moving outward from the center. So, yeah, okay, yeah, that's interesting. Now, you might, I might at this point note another little little tidbit. Um, you see, what you have here is stuff from spiral galaxies flowing into elliptical galaxies. And it's 3D, uh, flat space, flat space time, or Euclidean space. Yeah. So if all the matter ends up being going into elliptical galaxies, then what you have is a three-dimensional Euclidean space that is bounded, meaning there's a limit. It's not infinite. Yes. How do you get to that point? It's interesting, interesting concept, but how does the boundary derive? Well, <clears throat> well, let's get away from the galaxies for a while. I think of uh, a flat parking lot with a drain in the middle, the drain being the elliptical galaxy. Now start spraying water, that's your source, onto yeah. the parking lot. Eventually that puddle of water is going to reach the drain. And when it reaches the drain, the amount of water going down the drain equals the amount of water that's coming in from the hose. Yep. And that puddle then is going to have a limit, an outer bound. Oh, interesting. So there's the source is the spiral galaxy? Uh, the spiral galaxies are formed around sources, yes. And that is not that that's not original with me. That's the quasi steady state cosmology. Cool. Okay. And so the, and the sink then is not black holes. It is the the elliptical galaxies. Well, uh, that's one of the little theoretical issues today uh, for me is I'm not too sure what is in the center of an elliptical galaxy. Oh. Um, I mean, other than saying that it's a sink of the stuff of our universe, a thermodynamic sink, uh, you know, I don't know what to say is in the center. So this is a Star Trek thing, then. Well, there could be some exotic new thing there in the center. Like, we'd have to go there and find it. <laughs> or figure out some way to observe something. Yeah, okay. Uh, That's another... You know, now, now, Benny and Merrifield, that book... Uh, ends up going into quite a bit of detail about elliptical galaxies, and they also fall short when it gets to close to the center of the galaxy. Oh. You know, they don't, they don't really have much data there. Did anybody find anything uh, like a black hole in the center of the elliptical galaxy or in the galaxy? Well, <clears throat> uh, what does it say about that? Uh, they do find a lot of mass close to the center of elliptical galaxies. They also find that the uh, it's got frozen. just outside the center is very cold matter, meaning matter that's not moving very fast. That's what uh -huh. the cooling flow is all about, you see. Uh -huh. Now, within our own galaxy, uh, I cannot what, see now, the video. 20, 30 years, say again? Uh -huh. 
Oh, I, uh, now I can see the video. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for 20 or 30 years now, they've been tracking these stars that are very close to the center of our galaxy. Uh -huh. And the calculation is that they are operating or moving in a Neptunian, <laughs> Newtonian style, mm -hmm. you know, and therefore they calculate that there is a supermassive black hole. Uh, you see, the now, way. yeah, you see, that's, but what they can actually calculate is that the center of our galaxy is an area that's roughly 40 to 45 AU in diameter. Mm -hmm. And in that, you've got to have several million black holes. Really? You see, well... Oh, They've called it a supermassive black hole, but they have no data that it is one black hole. It yeah. could be it could be several million black holes wow. within 45 AU, and it would have the same data. Right. Okay. Oh. You see, now the Stowe comes in and says it's not a supermassive black hole. It's several million normal size, meaning sun, sun and a half mass black holes. And every once in a while, meaning once or twice a week, one of these black holes collapses and turns back into photons, which are the X-ray bursts that they oh. detect. Okay, that's interesting. So once okay, or twice. Now the X-ray burst. Say again. Go ahead. And the X-ray burst is another mystery, if you will, uh, unknown as to what the source of that is. For the X-ray burst that you see are of one frequency, meaning X-rays, without any other accompanying radiation. And it's that without accompanying radiation is where the uh, where the rub lies. Uh-huh. So, because if there was some other kind of thing, like an exploding supernova or something, you'd expect like loads of gamma, like high energy. Stuff. Well, if you have uh, just about any other kind of radiation emitting process going that's been observed in the universe uh it's almost always accompanied by other frequencies meaning yeah. lower frequencies including visual you see so why but, wouldn't so, oh yeah sorry go ahead so, so these x-ray bursts are actually a problem in modern yeah. physics certainly so x-ray kind of being um X-ray is below, hang on a sec. Uh, so, just below gamma, yeah. Okay, right. So why, um, so in your, so let's say just looking at a black hole, you know, usually in 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 the relativity sense, it slows down time, seems to be another dimension to it in some respect. How does your theory deal with that or how it keeps it as a 3D thing, yeah? Is it is it any way different to the, general relativity conception of a black hole being a singularity in space-time. Uh, yeah, it's not, not a singularity. Right. It's it's an assembly of Hodge, just like an electron is an assembly of Hodge. But a black hole oh, is so. um, enough Hodge to make up a sun collapse down into the smallest volume that it can be, but it's still a volume. Got you. Yeah. Now, now this business of time dilation is is a whole other issue. Okay, so maybe you we'll know. leave that for another time, or do you want to get into it? Well, I don't know. Uh, the uh, one of the other papers on YouTube you see there is uh, about special relativity, or pardon me, yeah, about special relativity, and uh, the the Stowe accepts length contraction in the form of the Lorentz ether theory, but not in the sense of special relativity. And that means it has length contraction, but it doesn't have time contraction. What time contraction is in the Stowe is the speed of light changing, such as with the Sapiro uh, delay observations. You talk about uh, that uh, you don't consider Doppler shift or Doppler effect. Uh, uh, the effect. Doppler the Doppler shift is a real effect which the Stowe supports. However, it does not support the idea that the uh, 
the redshift observed from other galaxies is the Doppler shift. Oh, okay. okay. I see one of the other papers there, uh, the first paper that was published at, back in 2003 uh, is just that. It follows Halton Arp's line of thinking rather than the uh, current model thinking. Right. So, the Hubble? That is the Doppler shift is caused by something. Okay. Say again. How about the Hubble uh, constant and the expansion of the universe? Yes, you can. Do you consider that? Um, the the Hubble constant is a particularly nasty <laughs> yeah. kind of thing these days. Um, the uh, the Hubble constant usually is thought of as a result of the Doppler shift with galaxies. And of course, I, I discount the Doppler shift as being the reason for the redshift of galaxies. Uh, and like I said, it follows ARP's thinking uh, more than the standard model's thinking. You so see? the, the Hubble so tension photons, are, as they, yeah. The Hubble tension and all is not necessary then. Uh, it's certainly a wrong calculation from the slow standpoint. Oh. I mean, it's based on the idea that the the galaxies and, of course, the cosmic microwave background and all that stuff is related to the Hubble constant as used in general relativity. And that's connected to the Doppler shift and all those things. And that then goes to Doppler shift and all. But you see, the slow rejects that. Oh. And it, it calculates the redshift of galaxies different from being a Doppler shift. Oh, okay. Or that is to say that the primary component of the redshift is not a Doppler shift. And like I said, it's, it was based on Halton Arp's idea that it's, uh, well, I guess, I guess they call it tired light. If you got to oh, put okay. a name to it, you oh, know, yeah. it's, it's like a tired <laughs> light model. Meaning yes. the the gradient, if you remember the equation, the gradient of the plenum as the photon goes through it changes the photon. Oh. You see, it causes, you know, changes the photon. And that is what is the redshift or blue shift. Now, the um, the redshift paper, which was the 2003 paper, uh, goes into and it explains not just redshift, but also there are galaxies out there that are blue shifted. Oh, and yeah. It also explains them. You see, it's blue shifted because you're coming into our galaxy. See, so the line that you draw, you know, when you plot the uh, the redshift or blue shift um, versus distance or what the what the Stowe calculates ends up explaining also the blue shift of galaxies, you see. Now, when you take a look at um, the slope of the line in the equation, you end up rederiving the Hubble law. Mm. But it's a Hubble law with a constant. Mm. OK, what's well, the Does constant? That, I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. But so, so the Hubble law is actually valid. Oh, you know, in the Stowe as well, because we redivide it and what that is from the standard cosmology. You redivide it, but it has no implication of it. Christopher was yeah. saying, sorry to interrupt you, Christopher, earlier. So uh, you were mentioning or you are asking was, a question or something. Yeah, I was asking a question about black holes, I think. But I just want to make sure. Um, I think we covered that, and then you moved on to something about length contraction was part of the stow, but not time contraction. Is that correct, John? How do you how do you allow for that? How like doesn't general relativity need um like isn't length contraction and time contraction really just the same thing viewed from a different perspectives? So something space? got frozen. <laughs> oh. Okay, can you? Did you miss? Uh, yeah, yeah, missed something. OK, I was just asking a question about uh, length contraction and time contraction that you can't have one without the other, essentially. 
the Lawrence. Uh, you mean well, the Lawrence. actually, you can. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Uh, the the other paper that's more recent is about the special relativity, and it takes a look at the uh, assumptions of the special relativity and kind of re-derives them or restates them in a Stowe context. Now, okay. um, time contraction in the Stowe is nothing more than a changing speed of light. And that's the Shapiro delay. Oh. What is so the, the Lorentz, you can explain the Lorentz contraction and all those things that talk, they talk about something like that? Uh, the, the length contraction part of it, yeah. Oh. And that's done in the, when I address special relativity and the assumptions of special relativity and the experiments that generated special relativity. Why do they have so much problem accepting uh, peer review, accepting your papers? You mentioned something like that. That they well, they're accepted. all on research. They're all on research gate. Okay. Is that maybe a we can publish because we are, uh, you know, uh, uh, Christopher also uh, probably in the next paper we want uh, if we if we can do the Canadian Journal, we may want to publish there. Oh yeah. I will, I'm sure. Um, and then uh, John may be able to join us also. And I will briefly present after John's presentation. I will briefly present ours. Uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I think we're, we're, well, I have a few more questions, but not too many. But um, it's interesting. Uh, there is a, a, a bit of a similarity between um, John's work and Wen Zong's, but they're not hugely similar. But they're kind of in the same area of study, but um, okay. mostly. Uh, Wen Zong's work is also in um, on the Canadian journals, uh, John, so you can check that out. And um, well, what Wen was Zong dropped off, huh? Sorry. No, uh, he's here. I think his video's gone. Oh, he's still here. Yes. I'm pretty uh, sure he's. Maybe he's able to hear us. I don't know. I think so. So the um, other interesting thing. I can say. Uh, yes, Wen Zong. Good. Uh, Would you like to say yeah. anything? I think we can. Uh, we lost your video, uh, Wen Song. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I'm uh, quite in interested in the actually. Okay, your connection is terrible. Is, uh, now. The transmission is not proper. We are not able to hear. Maybe I, I just. Uh, yeah, switch the video off. Keep the mic on. Let's, yeah, let's try maybe, that. yeah, yeah, we'll try that. Okay, that's okay. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay now. No. I'm not sure it is. No, yeah, it's still there. It's, it's going yeah, on and off. Yeah, it's yeah. basically it's just cutting in and out all the time when it's on. Uh, leave your any comments you have, post them in the chat. I'll read them out. Okay. If, if you can put something okay. in, that'd be the best thing to do. So I just have like a few more little questions. Well, not even really, just sort of statements. Um, I thought it was interesting you guys are talking about forces, not energy. And there's another guy online called, um, he's an Argentinian physicist. Bill Gady, and he's been in the news in the past and stuff, but he kind of has this idea that energy is just totally made up. You know, it's abstract. Yeah. It has nothing to do with physical reality whatsoever. <laughs> oh, and, but what uh, does he believe in? Does he believe in force or matter or anything like that? Mass, weight? I think he only believes in like what is like um, measurable. I, yeah, something like that. Like he's observably measurable. He's yeah. got some out there ideas, but I just, I just thought it was interesting. Like, I, I actually question whether he's even, he even believes in forces or no, he must though. But anyway, so the question I was going to ask was, um, you're not of that opinion, I take it, Hodge, uh, John. You believe that, that energy is a thing as well as forces, or, or that's what I'm trying to ask. Uh. 
if if you look at the, uh, the equation, the universal equation, you see that a force is a transformed quantity. You know, mathematically mapping. If if you get the subtlety, it's not real. It's a mathematical thing, and that's what the force is. You you calculate. You don't have to have a force in the equation. There's only two: the movement of the matter, which is the acceleration, okay. and the plenum density gradient. And the force calculation you do in between all that is actually a transformed quantity, meaning it's a mathematical mapping. Uh -huh. Yeah, I agree because initially I I had applied. No, the problem I have with. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, now the problem with the general relativity issue here, the problem in this day and age, is that it has just one quantity for mass, and that's it. It's mass, and it's movement of mass on the right-hand side, you see. And trouble is, there are types of mass. Right, and it's there being different types of mass which bring in the observations associated with photons, neutrinos, and electrons. These are different types of mass. In your model, they're all considered just mass. You see, say again. In, in your my model, yes. Different types of mass, but they're fundamentally all hard. Is that correct? Correct. No. Right, hards. With some plenum being captured by the HOD, that's the equivalence principle. And then the forces of the gradient of the plenum acts on the surface area of a HOD. Remember, it's a two dimensional device. You see, yeah. so photons can move at the fastest speed they can move because they have no force in their direction of movement being applied. There's no surface area. Right, and the same with neutrinos. Neutrinos are odds or age in kind of a sheet, and they can move in a direction perpendicular to the surface, or not perpendicular to the surface, parallel to the surface, and that will then exert no force on the neutrino, so they can move at the speed of light. So Pretty it's simple. the ones that are but slowly... electrons. If you think about it, is the ones that are slightly rotated to the plenum then feel the force and then that gives them the mass. Well, that's that's one of the experiences of mass is the gradient of the plenum on the surface area of the hod is one of the types of mass that there is. And what are the others? Well, the other is the hod itself and the other there is a sheet like a neutrino, and the third is where you assembly these hods in a in a three dimensional structure, so there isn't any direction that doesn't have some surface area, but the surface area changes. See with direction. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I think I've, I think I follow most of that. Um, yeah, I think I followed most of that. There was um. Couple of things, you know, there's a lot to take in, so I, I might have missed a few things. But it's a good thing about this video is that I can always watch it back mm -hmm. and read your papers as well, which I'm going to do. Um, was there anything else that I had to ask there? Quasi-state physics? Did you mention that? Quasi-semi-state physics? Uh, Quasi-state cosmology. Right. Okay. So to do with quasi-particles or? Oh, cos cosmology, sorry. Uh, the the QSSC, this quasi-steady state cosmology, is a derivation of Hoyle and Burbage's and Narkvar's thinking. Nice. And in, what was it, 2002 or 2003, they published a book kind of summarizing their thinking. Sure. But what they what they have as a thinking and what they wanted to explain was rotation curves and some other things um, which has to do with there being a creation of matter in a universe rather than a big bang 
So the beginning of the universe in quasi-steady state cosmology is that there's one little source, you know, the center of something that's going to become a spiral galaxy. And then according to ARPS data, these things break apart. You know, one source turns into two, turns into three, and that's ARPS data where he looks at these uh, QSRs, quasi quasars, and how they line up to current source galaxies, okay? But the QSSC then comes along and says, well, there's a source at the center of spiral galaxies. And this explains rotation curves and a few other observations that they have, you see? And what, what the stow does is adds sinks to that source. Great, I like it. And so it kind of reminds me of like uh, water coming out of a sprinkler. Is is that and then is that what's driving the rotation or a little bit or the, the source is the galaxy and the, the fact that it's coming out is kind of driving the rotation? Did because that was the little bit that I kind of didn't follow well, earlier. But anyway, I think well, I think you a lot uh, of it. no, the the source is creating a very high plenum density at the center. And and then that falls off with radius. And that the gradient of that then is an outward force. And that's what you want to do with dark matter is you want an outward force on these stars that are in their uh, disks part of the spiral galaxies. Okay, got it. So it's my an outward force, see. My sprinkler which also I... gives you the planet nine. Yeah, it's interesting. It'd be weird. It's weird the way that, that that would tie in like, on such a, you know, but it's cool. It could, it could work. There was one of the, it's, this is, this whole theory reminds me of like, um, a theory of general relativity or special relativity. If this was an alternate dimension, you know, this is like everything, but it's a little slightly different and rearranged. It's cool. One other thing I'd like to point out is that Wenzong mentioned in the chat. Yeah. John's 2D photon is, uh, very similar or the same as cycloid cycloid, cycloid. Motion. yeah so cycloid motion of photon and he has he has made it put a link to uh, the canadian journal of pure and applied sciences so i'm going to open that and share it so that we can see what he means um let me just share the screen oh <laughs> i meant the wrong area and i'm this should be it. Yes, Zhang's paper. Um, can you guys see that? Understanding the Planck constant and yeah. the behavior of photon particles from, mechanic, from a mechanical perspective. Now, I'm just going to make it a bit bigger. You guys can okay. see that. Oh, yeah, it's much better. Thanks. Cool, yeah, because we had a bit of a problem last oh, time. Yeah. I Reading to. that, yeah. It was not good. Zooming out, <laughs> zooming, yeah. zooming helps a lot. <laughs> yeah. So this is cool. So, oh yeah, we are going to look for, what was it again? A cycloid photon. I'd, I just want to, I'd like to see if there's... Cycloid um, motion of a photon or something. Okay, it's a motion thing. So it could be... Yeah, equation of motion or something. Circular motion of the harmonic oscillator. Um, we'll just skim through it. But what I can do is I'd I'd like to um yes I'm just gonna ah uh, I'm gonna we can at some point uh, put a summary of you know our our all all the things together we can make a collage and then see where where it connects maybe that may help what's the common things that we talk about what are the differences. It's like comparison and comparing and contrasting. Sure. So we got it right. We got the harmonic oscillators, which he did talk about last um, the, in the last uh, presentation he did. But we didn't really get into the whole harmonic oscillator. Yeah. Thing. We didn't I don't understand. I am able to read the whole thing yet. But I think we can simplify that. We will put on a platform and then ask everybody to put certain key points and then that will help to 
because the whole thing reading takes a long time um, and we are trying to finish our paper also. So I think this will find a way so that we can understand the gist of it, you know, of, of, of John's work and Wen Sang's work and our work and versus the quantum physics and the relativity theory of everything. So I'm trying to put them on the same platform and able to compare and contrast, you know. Uh, I'd just like to say one other thing, though. Uh, maybe a, a point of comparison between Wen Zong's and John's uh -huh. would, would be um, Wen Zong believes the universe to be eternal because of the cy cy cycling motion of energy and mass. No the, Big Bang. No Big Bang. No Big Bang, yes. Yeah. So, John, your theory could be eternal or it could be non-eternal. Does it have an opinion? On that? I have no opinion on that. Understood. Yeah. So uh, from from a philosophical standpoint, let me say that what we know is a small part of, of a universe. And to go beyond that and speculate on the beginning or the ending is currently outside of our science. And it's just pure yeah, speculation. Yeah, of nice. course, you have this idea that there's water, you know, to use your analogy, there's water coming out of the hose and then down a drain. You know, there's no, the water could, is has been flowing, so it could just continue flowing or it could stop at any time. There's no, there's no, um, it's outside of your purview to state whether or not. But um, what well, about the Big Bang? Yeah, we don't know enough. Yes. So, but, but would your model include a Big Bang or not? Probably would. Uh, it would not. Oh, I mean, would the one, one thing you can't have with this though is a big bang. <laughs> okay. And, oh, so it doesn't that preclude big bang? Why it, pre that, it, it that precludes because... a big bang. The model precludes? precludes a big bang. Oh, it precludes. precludes. It cannot include a big bang. Why not? Well, observationally, the observation of spiral galaxies prohibit an inflow model, meaning matter cannot be coming into a spiral galaxy. OK. I so, mean, the observations of, such as the hydrogen gas clouds, the action of the planets close to the center, um, the, what, what do you call it, the, the upper case Z relationship with the red shift. Um, there are several spiral rotation curves that reject dark matter. These are rising rotation curves, see? They actually reject the dark matter hypothesis and of course modified gravity and the like. Okay, well, now, yeah, go on. The, um, the nature of beginning one of the tenets of the STO is uh, actually what you might call a fractal model or self-similarity. It means all size scales have analogies to other size scales, okay? Now think about the beginning of everything in our universe, of people, of animals, of plants. You start with a seed and then you acquire other stuff to make it bigger. That's the nature of beginning. And the only exception to that in the current standard model is the Big Bang itself, where you have everything in the universe at one point and then it begins. Oh, so inflation, and, and inflation. That, that I just find philosophically rejection, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I agree nothing that. we know of. Yeah, yeah, they say everything, it's like a small, everything starts with one singularity and then inflation, and then inflation. Well, yeah, I don't like that word singularity, but yeah, everything starts small as a seed and then it goes from there. Yeah. Now, this is why I brought up Halton Arp and his work. He says that QSRs, quasars, uh, are ejected from spiral galaxies and he has lots of data on that. And then each one of those quasars eventually turns into another spiral galaxy. So you see, that's the growing of the universe is the oh, birthing of right. spiral so like galaxies. Seeds thing, they're seeding the might throughout the world universe. 
Um, that's interesting. That reminds me of, uh, sorry, um, a lecture I saw related to um, the electric universe people who have a plasma model of the universe. And um, he saw these chains of some, some guy, it might have been, I don't know, I can't remember his name, I'd have to look it up, but he saw these like chains of of um, quasars, I think they were, forming uh, in space. And uh, you, you don't know about this, uh, John, do you? Or this doesn't? Well, I don't know who that is, but that uh, sounds very similar to what Halton Arp has. And he has photos of galaxies with these quasars extending in opposite directions from the center. Yeah. And as they go out, they, if you believe that that string of galaxies uh, is quasars with a high redshift, then outer further out in the same line, you have other spiral galaxies with much lower redshifts. I think See? that was, I think that was what I watched. Yeah. Possibly it yeah, was our that's that's Halton Arp. That the original one of that is Halton Arp, but I think the electric universe did kind of take on that kind of thought. Well, what's your opinion on the electric universe? Is it uh well, is... obviously I have my own model, so <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Fair so why yeah, do you think well, uh oh Christopher, you got something? Can I... No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh so you are thinking that uh, uh the spiral galaxies somehow form like outer bound or boundaries, and the elliptical galaxies are inside, caught inside, something like that. Is that? Yes, that's the uh, galaxy cluster. Is spiral galaxies on the outside, elliptical galaxies more or less in the center? Okay. Well, how does these spiral galaxies form? I mean, how does they appear in the first place, like that? Well, uh, in in current today spiral galaxies form from other spiral galaxies that's to say you have a source and the source is energetic enough that it kind of splits in two and you have then two sources uh -huh. and that then is a quasar you know it's a sort it's a source without mass without all the mass around that a spiral galaxy has but as it exists for a longer period of time that mass comes from the source, the quasar, and forms another spiral galaxy around it. And that's the Halton Arp model. But uh, what is a progenitor spiral galaxies, the initial one, which, which starts off or free, which triggers the formation of other spiral galaxies? What is the initial one? How, how, where does it occur? How does it occur? And what is the, you know, situational well, uh, aspect? This is getting very speculative, but the source of the first spiral galaxy, just one, right? This the initial quasar. Yeah, it is probably the same source as they currently think of the Big Bang. Oh, meaning you have the same kind of question with where it is, what what was part of that yeah. initial singularity, you know? Yeah, and it's a different me, way of looking at it. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah it's you like, know, whatever the source of that is, is the same source of this one spiral galaxy. But there you have a single seed, which uh -huh. then forms everything else. Oh, I see. You see, as opposed to bingo, all it's there. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that could work. I mean, it's a bit like in evolutionary theory, you know, people are trying to explain evolution through, you know, that process. And what people ask, but how did it all start? And that's, that's a different field, isn't it? I forgot what it's called, uh, abiogenesis or something like that, uh, which I just understood the meaning of uh, from a etymological point of view. So yeah, some people think that uh, genesis itself is it biogenesis or a bio? Like, is it a, a organic or inorganic origin? Some people even question that. Oh yeah, of course. Well, unless you come I... from inorganic, didn't it? Initially, yeah, it's not that's what I would think. But see, what I think also dark matter, I don't know, we can talk about later. My uh, taking, when I look at it, it's like a noise that we cannot measure. That's what dark matter for me. It's like a whole lot of noise that we cannot measure that appears as dark energy or something. Okay. And, yeah. and, 
that's that then uh, so it's like noise and with a very low signal to noise ratio very close to zero and when the somehow the uh, oscillations occur the no, the signal to noise ratio increases and becomes signal and you see real energy that we see and it converts to matter that we see oh yeah i like that that's a nice picture on the on the universe i, I think and we can derive from our model uh, after john's presentation we, i will briefly talk about that absolutely uh, one there's another question from wenzong or wenzong, yeah. okay um flat rotation curve tully fisher law modified Newtonian law of gravity has been calculated quantitatively with inflow super photons. So uh, that might be a different article there. Fluctuations can cause birth or death of stars, but total energy and equivalent mass are conserved. So uh, I don't know if that's, um, we probably need to read that paper to understand that. Do you guys know much about Tully Fisher law or? Or any of those terms there that I didn't really pick up on alone. I can I can share the this document as well. So you're saying that there's a boundary to the universe, John, yeah? Which is yes. um so how big is the universe in your estimation? <laughs> we can't measure it. It's an it's enormous then, is it? Oh yeah. It, it does have a boundary, Maybe. but is it is it almost it's, infinite? Is or? it infinite? Well, <laughs> it has no bound, you see. No bound, no bound. Yeah. So, yeah, well, oh, well, if you're going to about... believe that the universe, uh, oh, pardon me, if, if you're going to believe that the universe is three dimensional, uh -huh. which I do, you know, then you have this problem. The, the, the problem since Newton is that how do you keep it from being infinite? Mm -hmm. Well, infinite is an undefined quantity. It just mean whatever you think of it's bigger, you know. Uh, so you reject infinite philosophically, but then you got to have three dimensions. And the way you do that is you have sources and sinks and mm -hmm. think about a heat equation kind of thing. Um, and so there's a there's a bound. So you're going to um, have a bound three dimensional in our universe. So the only question is uh, open or closed. That may be a. Uh... Fairly good question, I think, right? What do you think? That like it could be uh, either open, the uh, universe could be an open system or it could be a closed system. Well, I think the universe itself uh, is closed, uh, but it's the real not one. 80. Yeah, it's closed, meaning sources and sinks, and that's it. Uh -huh. And everything flows from sources to sinks, and that's everything uh -huh. there is. But it's not adiabatic. It's not adiabatic. So it is yeah. increasing. So it is actually uh, expanding. In the paper that talks about the temperature of the cosmic microwave background, uh -huh. you'll see that it that it proposes that the universe is actually oscillating in temperature. Oh. You see. And so where it is currently in temperature is the temperature is declining. And that brings it somewhat similar to the cyclic universe kind of model. See, several of the problems, and I don't know, you, this is, gets to be a kind of a long discussion, but uh -huh. several of the problems with the general relativity expanding universe model is uh -huh. actually solved by what is called the cyclic universe. Oh. Uh, this is Penrose and Steinhardt and some of those guys. Okay. Yeah. You see, they, they have proposed the cyclic model. But it's key to their thinking that the universe is currently decreasing uh -huh. in temperature. Oh. And that is what I say is going on now. Uh, but uh, you know, but that it cyclic so, means, is it oscillating means? It's like a breathing universe. Breathing right, means. Right. The temperature is increasing and decreasing over time. Interesting. Right, and can it's, you see that? it's cycling. Yeah. Think, for instance, a thermostat. Think of your room thermostat. Uh -huh. You have a uh -huh. heat source. If it's cold outside. It gets cold outside here, but it's cold outside, and you have a thermostat. You set the uh -huh. thermostat, but when the heater comes on, 
the uh -huh. temperature will rise above the thermostat level, and then it turns, uh -huh. the heat turns off, and the temperature goes back down. Yes. You see, but you can think of this temperature going up and down uh, uh -huh. in terms of the pressure and volume of the universe. Yes. So the universe yes. is expanding and contraction along with where the temperature is around oh, some man. average. And that average is 2.18 or something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I like the uh, the thermodynamic aspect. I, I like the thermodynamic aspect. I think it makes more sense, more realistic, you know, what we see, we can correlate with what we see the observable. So I think that should be very much part of the thing. I mean, the physics had to explain that. Like John has, John is more an experimental physicist. So that's important, you know. Uh, we are more in the theoretical kind of physics, but we we I like to get into the observable. Back. I I want to emphasize the observable because any theory that doesn't not come up with the observable, you know, a lot of this mathematics they do, but there is no observable. I I don't know whether where it goes. I mean, it should have. That's why I'm trying to connect as fast as possible to observable. And when I present it, you will see that we that's what we are trying to do. The last like. We had like four or five, I have like four or five peer reviewed, already accepted. And uh, this one is almost there. You can show that. And uh, so, uh, you know, but as fast as possible, gauge it and bring it to level that we can do observe, we can do observable, uh, not just the mathematics. So I believe not in so much mathematical physics, but our physical mathematics, you know, that explains the physics, the mathematics that explains the physics rather than ma you know, trying to say that, okay, it, the physics had to fit into the mathematics. That's what many of the set theory, the present theories are forcing that you derive that mathematics and the physics had to somehow fit into that. I don't, I don't agree with that. I agree. It should be the other way around. I think. What okay. do you think, John? Yeah. The same, meaning in the end, it's the observations and experimental results yes. that matter. Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay. And it helps prediction if you can explain these yes. things. Right. And you'll see in my work there, the things that I concentrated on are those problem areas of current physics. Yes. Yeah, I went through some of it. I, actually, I caught, when I present it, I'll show you in our thing, I caught one of your results in the, in your uh, asymmetric uh, North Pole and South Pole. You have caught it that, and that paper is now accepted. And it's partly online also. Did, where you, did you have a chance, Christopher, to see our paper? It's already in the thing. I think I can pull it up. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I looked for it and I got, uh, oh, what was that message? Anyway, you have to request it or something. Okay. I, I will. Uh, I will actually. I looked for it. On, okay. Yeah, I looked for it on ResearchGate. Okay. Uh, no, it's on online also. There is a. Uh, let me post it. Let me try to pull it up and post it. Uh, our paper. See if you can share it. Screen share. Yeah. It. Yeah. Is it on the Oriental Journal or? Yeah. Is this... Oriental oh. Journal website. Wow, that's yeah. great. It's already there. So it's a placeholder, but they had to make the edition. It's nice that they put it because. It gives us a placeholder, you know, and they now they can manipulate, put our, you know, put our thing. Uh, let me just me pull it up. I'll put the. Uh, Is it working for you? Let me uh, let me first put it. You can continue talking, but I will. Uh, uh, and finish John's presentation. Yeah, before. John, thanks uh, very much. I think we covered a lot of stuff there. Um, and we'll probably go into Rajan's thing okay. and if he gets ready. Let me, okay, let me pull up our paper. The, uh, I have a PowerPoint also, but before that, let me pull our paper. Okay. So I can share it on the chat as well. One thing I guess I didn't understand, John, is what, what you were talking about spacing and something to do with the capital Z and the radius it was something about a creator creating this creating spacing so it was like uh, the the uppercase Z is called metallicity and it has to do with the size 
of atoms or you might call it the elements. There are heavier elements closer to the center of spiral galaxies than there are further out. Further out, there's hydrogen. Hydrogen goes into suns and then it forms other elements. And one of the things that's kind of unexplained in current models is this metallicity to radius relationship. And metallicity is the capital level C. Uh huh. Interesting. You can look up metallicity on something, you know, on Wikipedia or whatever. Okay, cool. So I'm posting our paper. Let me see one second. I have to.